All right, all right, Rad Nation. Today we're gonna to be talking about CT detectors. How do they work and what's important in a good CT detector? I'm Brian from How Radiology Works. We have bite-sized information in the radiology field. First off, you've probably seen our videos on CR and on DR in X-ray imaging. And you're wondering to yourself, I know how X-rays are detected. I know how that they're used in medical imaging. So why is CT any different? So CT is different for a couple of reasons. Compared with standard X-ray imaging, CT needs to be very fast. On a state-of-the-art CT system, you're going around and the fastest system right now goes around with a rotation time of 0.23 seconds. So if you want about a thousand views in one rotation, that means you need more than 4,000 readouts every second. So this compares with reading out 15 times a second or maybe 30 times a second in a really fast mode on a DR system. So we're talking about a couple of orders of magnitude faster CT has to be compared with a standard X-ray system. CT also has to have a very high dynamic range. The values in the detector need to be accurate such that we can make accurate CT numbers in our CT images. This is another reason why CT needs to have a high dynamic range. So we're gonna lead you just a little bit here as far as what are the properties that are optimal for a good CT detector? So we just came up with this little acronym here, linearity. So linearity is a fancy way of saying if my input goes up by a factor of two, my output will also go up by a factor of two. So it's just saying if I made a plot of the input versus the output, it would just be a straight line. And that's something that we'd like to have that if we deposit twice as much X-ray energy in our detector, we'd like this signal that we get out to be twice as much. We don't want it to do what's called saturate, where at a higher level, the signal goes down. So linearity is number one, what we'd like to get in a good CT detector. We also like it to be stable. CT is used as bread and butter imaging, and we want stable, dependable imaging over time. And E is for efficient. We'd like the system to be efficient. And what we mean by efficient here is that converting our X-ray energy into our measured signal, we'd like to do that with a relatively high efficiency. If the system is relatively inefficient, that means there's gonna be dose that's going through the patient, but isn't able to be measured on our detector. So we'd like to have an efficient system. As for afterglow, and the idea is that on our systems, they're gonna generate an electrical signal and we're going to be reading that electrical signal out. That electrical signal is gonna start relatively quickly right after the X-ray interacts in the detector. And then a very long time later, even seconds later, that's what we call the afterglow in the detector. And we also are gonna talk about the decay time so as the signal comes in, then it goes down relatively quickly. That's the primary decay time of the signal in the detector. So we'd like to have a low afterglow and we'd like for our primary decay time to be fast. The readout was relatively slow. You can imagine as we expose from one view and then we go to another view several views later, if there was still a contribution from the earlier view, then you could have a ghost image of the earlier view overlaid into the later views acquisition. So this is why we want to have a relatively fast detector with relatively low afterglow. Detector technology, which was dominant throughout the industry for some time, was actually gas ionization chambers. So if you've seen our video on ionization chambers, they're used for dosimetry frequently, and they were used previously for CT detectors. The way this would work is you would have regions that are separated by tungsten septa, and these gas-filled regions would be filled at a relatively high pressure to increase the probability of the X-ray interacting with the gas. When the X-ray comes in, what's gonna happen is it was gonna interact with the gas and it's going to ionize or remove electrons from the gas. Those electrons then, if there's an electric field, are gonna be pulled towards the anode. So imagine you have a wire here and imagine that area is positive. 
the electrons will be pulled towards that anode and then the readout will happen by reading out your electrical signal. And then finally, your electrical signal that we show here is just those ions that are gonna be collected on the anode and then coming out as we show here in red. What are some properties of these CT detectors? They are stable. So over time, they don't change their properties significantly. That is very good from the perspective of CT. They're also relatively consistent. So if you're looking at two neighboring air chambers, they're gonna perform relatively consistent with one another. That's also very good for the calibration perspective on CT. They did require relatively high pressures. So 20, 25 times the pressure of a standard atmosphere. And that was done to improve the efficiency or the probability that the X-rays were gonna interact. But even at those relatively high pressures, there was a relatively low efficiency. So we call it quantum detection efficiency or the efficiency of X-ray energy being converted to our electrical signal. So in these gas-filled CT detectors, the efficiency was only about 50%. So because that's not extremely high, that's the reason why CT detectors actually are no longer done this way with gas-filled detectors. The current state of the art is actually with scintillators. So scintillator is actually a crystal. X-rays hit that crystal. They are gonna actually interact and visible photons are gonna come out. So as the X-rays come in, the visible photons are gonna come out. They're gonna be going in all directions. We want to have a way to trap the visible photons inside of each of these little scintillator blocks. So we do that by having reflectors. So there's optical reflectors all around each one of these little blocks. And each one of these little blocks, essentially, will, there will be a number of X-ray interactions that will happen, and that will generate many visible light photons per a single X-ray photon. And that way there's gonna be basically a lot of visible light going on inside of this cube here. And then that visible light, we have something called a photodiode. Photodiode is then gonna convert that visible light into the electrical signal. Electrical signal then is gonna come out of the photodiode. There's typically gonna be then what we call an application specific integrated circuit or an ASIC for short. And that's just a set of electronics, which is gonna do some comparison operations. And we wanna do that very close to where the signal is measured so that we don't need a long cable length. If we have a long cable length, that can lead to more what's called capacitance in the circuit. And it makes the measurements less accurate when you make these measurements. Rays go to visible light, which then goes to an electrical signal via this photodiode. Uh, quantum detection efficiency is significantly higher on the scintillator systems, upwards of 80-90% in comparison with the 50% in the gas chambers. Relative geometric efficiency is something we also talk about, and that's basically how tightly can you pack these in such that you have a lot of scintillator. So we talked about we need a little bit of reflector to go around the outside, but that amount of reflector isn't really a significant amount of the surface area. So most scintillator can actually take up most of the surface area, which can then detect the X-rays. So we're saying that's a relatively high geometric detection efficiency. They are stable and they also can be relatively fast. So there's different types of scintillator materials that are used by the different vendors. And one advantage, for instance, I work for General Electric and we have one proprietary one that we call Gemstone. And that gemstone we use for spectral imaging, so we call it gemstone spectral imaging. And the reason we do that is because it has a very fast decay time so that one view to another view, we don't have corruption of our signal because the decay time is so fast of that light signal within the crystal. The method we wanna talk about is actually taking that scintillator and flipping it on its side and then adding another one. So the idea here is you could have two different levels of scintillator. You'd have one thinner scintillator on the top and then one thicker scintillator on the bottom. These also could be different scintillator materials. 
So your x-ray is coming down. It's then going to interact in the top layer. And if it has significant enough energy, it's also going to interact in the bottom layer. So you can get a readout. Actually, the photodiodes are now on the side of the crystal here instead of on the bottom. So you can get a readout from the top layer and then you get a readout from the bottom layer. And these are very fast readouts. Each detector element, as the x-rays are seeing, you'll have a top and a bottom component and you'll get two different readouts. Lower energy x-ray. The lower energy x-ray is going to deposit more of its energy in the top layer. If it was a very low energy, it could potentially deposit all of its energy in the top layer. But in general, you're going to have a lower energy x-ray is depositing more of their energy in the top layer. And then the higher energy x-rays are going to be depositing more of their energy in the bottom layer. That way, by arranging the scintillator like this, you can actually get out some spectral information by having a top and a bottom layer of your scintillator. Dual layer scintillator detectors also have a high quantum detection efficiency because you have those two layers of scintillators, so they're going to be good at absorbing the x-rays. They have a little bit lower geometric efficiency because now you have the photodiode, which you have to arrange in there, and that's gonna take up a little bit more room than just the reflector would. These are also going to be very stable, and these systems have some inherent ability to do dual energy imaging because like we talked about, the detector material itself, because you're getting those two readouts, you're going to have some sensitivity to lower energy x-rays in comparison with higher energy x-rays as they interact with your detector. It's really state of the art what basically all the CT systems in the field are. There's right now just a handful of CT systems that are coming on the market that are what's called photon counting detectors. If you're interested in that kind of technology, drop me a comment down below and we can make a video on photon counting detectors. But for right now, check out our video on digital x-ray to see how the detectors work in x-ray imaging.